everyone, my name is Helen and welcome back to Women in Film Reviews. So remember last year when I said this? In two weeks time I will be staying on the animation train and fully embracing the holiday season and talking about Arthur Christmas. Uh, yeah, sorry about that one guys. You have probably figured this out already if you've been watching this channel for really any amount of time in the past year, but I didn't really get to end season one of Women in Film Reviews on my own terms. The short answer to all of that is I got a job around that time that took up so much energy that I didn't have time to make the videos, and then the pandemic hit. But I have finally started this series again, it's December, and I finally get to talk about <laughs> Arthur Christmas. But where in the pantheon of holiday-themed theatrically released films does it fall? Let's find out, shall we? But before I get into everything, I just want to let you guys know that I actually recorded a commentary track for Arthur Christmas along with my husband, Tim. That is our December movie commentary that is exclusive to my Patreon patrons. So if you want to get a little bit more insight into my thoughts around Arthur Christmas, or you just want to have a laugh while you watch, Click the link below to get access to all of my movie commentary tracks with Tim, along with some other goodies for just five pounds a month. Right, here's the gist. Arthur Christmas is an animated co-production between Ardwin Animations, who is the studio behind Wallace and Gromit, and Sony Pictures Animation. A British-American collaboration, shall we say. The perfect movie for me and my husband. Arthur Christmas was directed by Sarah Smith in her feature directorial debut, and she also co-wrote the film alongside Peter Bainham, whose resume includes, and no, I'm not kidding, the original Borat movie. We'll come back to why this is important in a little bit. The movie itself is based on a relatively simple premise. With so many children to deliver gifts to in one night, and a heavily modernized world, how does Santa get it all done? Well, in this version of events, the office of Santa is actually a hereditary one that is passed down through generations. And the current Santa, real name Malcolm, is merely the figurehead over a military-style operation. There are thousands of elves working on this high-tech operation under the direction of Santa's oldest son, Steve, who on this particular Christmas expects to officially be named the next Santa following Malcolm's retirement. In the context of all of this, we have Arthur, Malcolm's younger son, who loves Christmas to bits, but he works in the mailroom department answering all of the letters that children write to Santa each year. The reason he has this position on paper is that he's very, very clumsy and everyone else just wants him out of their way. At the end of this year's run, Arthur notices that one gift meant for a young girl in England named Gwen has actually gone undelivered by mistake. When no one else seems to care about the missed child, he teams up with his grand Santa, Malcolm's father, and a gift wrapping elf named Bryony, and to use the old sleigh and reindeer to make sure that Gwen gets her gift on time. Okay, where do I start with this movie? It cannot just be me just gushing about how good it is for 20 minutes. I have to say something constructive after all. Let's start with the immense creativity behind the film. When I say that Santa has gone high tech, I truly mean it. The opening gift delivery run of the film perfectly illustrates just how far this operation has come, with a huge sleigh that covers the entire city and elves rappelling down to perform discreet missions and place gifts under trees without waking the kids. They have naughty nice meters to measure what kids should get in their stockings. There's even a giant mission control headquarters at the North Pole with thousands of elves working under Steve's direction. There's even a super tense sequence where everyone has to help Santa escape from a room where a child has accidentally woken up. It is one of the most intense scenes in any movie, I have to say. I also have to say that this movie embodies a lot of what I love about British comedy and British humor, specifically when it comes to movies like Edgar Wright, Shaun of the Dead, and Hot Fuzz. The film makes fun of so many tropes in classic Christmas movies and spy movies, but at the same time, it is very sincere in its appreciation of both of those genres. In fact, I would say that its pure Britishness is something that I've come to love about this movie even more, especially after I moved to the UK. For example, the military-style operation down to Steve's Christmas tree camo outfit 
is a clear jab at America and how obsessed it is with military spending. Or, if you want to look at it another way, you could say it's a bit of a satirical take on what working for Amazon might be like. This film may have come out in 2011, but Steve, particularly at the beginning, reminds me more and more of Jeff Bezos these days. Either of those two interpretations is something that a completely American team probably wouldn't have been able to come up with on its own. But a crew with people like Peter Bainham from the outside of the US is able to poke fun at just how ridiculous we look to the rest of the world. The film is also a not-so-subtle plug at the UK monarchy, not least because Mrs. Claus is basically Queen Elizabeth II in animated form. Also, I love this because they never could have predicted it. Um, Imelda Staunton, who plays Mrs. Claus in this film, is actually set to play Queen Elizabeth in seasons 5 and 6 of The Crown, so just, you know, prophetic is what this movie is. <laughs> I mean, Malcolm is basically a monarch who just refuses to retire and hand the office down to his oldest child, and honestly, especially as Queen Elizabeth is approaching her 70th year on the throne, um, I can't help but feel that Charles is feeling a little bit of what Steve feels here, maybe a little impatient. Um, not, not for anyone to die, but um, long time to be an heir, yeah. The film's Britishness is also addressed in lots of little ways, such as the Christmas crackers that they open at the beginning of the film over dinner, which I didn't know about until I came over here, and I'm sad that I didn't know about it my entire childhood, um, as well as putting oranges in the children's stockings. Not to mention the British voice cast, the destination of the gift, which is Cornwall, and just the overall wonderful execution of British humor at its finest, truly. The film works so well for me in part because of its Britishness and the sincerity of its approach. And this sincerity is embodied in our protagonist, Arthur. Arthur is super into Christmas, and he could have been written as an annoying fanboy of Christmas, kind of like the types who gatekeep things like Star Wars or Star Trek. But as much as Arthur loves Christmas, he really just wants everyone around him to be happy, and that means pushing past his own high anxieties and other obstacles to do so. As someone who does suffer from a lot of anxiety, I would say that Arthur is actually a pretty good example of like what an anxious person would actually be like on screen. To quote the internet, I feel seen. He is not bitter at all about not being the next Santa, and in fact, he's actually very supportive and encouraging of Steve even after Malcolm doesn't hand over the reins to him. Unfortunately, Steve doesn't carry that same affection for his younger brother. Instead, viewing him as a nuisance. There's a scene where Arthur and Steve are talking about the undelivered gift, and Arthur says something super sincere, and Steve just brushes him off and reminds him not to leave the doors open. It's kind of heartbreaking. And arguably worse, Malcolm sometimes forgets about his younger son and the work he does until he gets in trouble over something, while simultaneously praising Steve's work and also not understanding Steve's work and the importance of what he does. Malcolm actually kind of did both of his sons wrong in the fact that he was really an absent father who was more focused on being the figurehead than a father to his own sons. To the point that he actually still treats his adult sons like children. And then there's Grand Santa who even in his willingness to help Arthur deliver the gift when no one else will, is doing it for his own selfish reasons in order to prove that the old way was the best way. All while spouting all of the tactics that he used back in the day to make a run successful that definitely would not be allowed now. At its core, this is a movie about a highly dysfunctional family that has drifted apart over so many years and they need to be able to grow and learn to appreciate each other again and the flaws that each character has along with the relationships that they have with each other make them even more believable and relatable because they remind us of the relationships that we have with our own family sometimes. There are two characters that I haven't mentioned yet that I think are the unsung heroes of this movie and so I'll talk about them here for a little bit. I am, of course, referring to our two major female characters, Mrs. Claus and Bryony Shelfley, Gift Wrapping Division. 
Whereas the men, Arthur included, are portrayed as inept, selfish, or both, these two women are the voice of reason and a much needed grounding force in this movie. Bryony is the more prominent of the two characters. She travels with Arthur and Grand Santa in order to deliver Gwen's gift on time. And her skills with gift wrapping and her high-tech equipment save all of them from some pretty sticky situations all through the film. But Mrs. Claus is also very adept at her job, keeping the North Pole running while the men in her life take little notice of what she does. Again, she's not bitter about it. She just wants to make everyone happy. She also encourages Malcolm to retire when it's really clear that he can't do his job anymore. And she reminds him that he wouldn't be no one if he wasn't Santa anymore. He'd be her Malcolm. And she is also ready to go immediately when she discovers that Arthur is missing on Christmas. She even took a training course on how to fly the S1, and she repeatedly rebuffs her husband's extremely dated and sexist remarks about what he considers to be her usefulness. Her look and character design might on the surface feel like another matronly stereotype, but going along with the movie's theme about the importance of family, her work is never treated as less important than that of her husband's or her two sons. This movie also has a message that really stood out to me more on this most recent viewing, and not least because of the current just pandemic situation that we're all in right now. When it seems that all is lost in the quest to deliver Gwen's gift on time, Arthur has a really important epiphany that it doesn't matter who got Gwen's gift there successfully, it just matters that it got there. She's never going to know which of the four Santas has done it, just as long as she knows that Santa remembered her. And the most important thing to Arthur throughout this entire film is being able to keep the magic alive for her. This is a story about putting the needs of others before your own in order to make everyone's lives better. Really boiling down to a conflict between individual glory and the greater good. I can't believe that we have to say this in 2020, and I'm sorry to get political on this channel, even though I really don't think this is a political thing, it just baffles me that a lot of people seem to think that the world revolves around them and that therefore they don't need to wear a mask to help stop the spread of this disease. I don't want to open up a whole other can of worms because this video is not about that, but I do think that a lot of those people could do with watching this movie. Just saying. Arthur Christmas sits its viewers, children and adults, down and through its ending tells them that sometimes you have to give up some conveniences in your life in order to improve the world around you. Steve has wanted to be Santa for his entire life, but in the end, when the gift finally gets delivered thanks to the efforts of all six of our main cast, he realizes that his klutzy younger brother is actually the one who's best suited for the role of Santa, and he promises to support him. The reason why Arthur is the best candidate is he isn't motivated by selfish reasons. His selflessness and his caring attitude towards everyone are the things that make him best suited for the job. Arthur's not concerned with how happy the job would make him, or the credit that he would get for it but he's more concerned with the happiness of the children he delivers the gifts to. The epilogue, which shows what everyone's like a year later, highlights this perfectly. Everyone is happy with their new station in life, but Arthur is the one who made everyone happy. The third major theme that this movie tackles is the struggle between old versus new technology. I already mentioned this a little bit in terms of how Grand Santa wants to prove that the old ways were better full stop, but this movie actually dives a little bit deeper into that conflict through the way that Steve and Arthur both separately approach Christmas. Arthur is pretty tech-phobic. He uses tactile methods such as pen and paper to answer all of the letters that kids write to Santa each year, and his workroom is also very isolated and unorganized. Putting a personal touch on a letter is so important to him, and I think the opening of the film where Gwen reads her letter aloud and then we hear Arthur's response to the letter highlight his commitment to making each child feel special perfectly. One gets the idea that maybe he would be more efficient with this if he had a physical filing system in place or maybe a couple of elves to help him out, but it's very clear that everyone at the North Pole undervalues Arthur and his job and doesn't see his position as really 
an essential part of running Christmas. So he has to do it all himself. This contrasts greatly with Steve, who is all about automation and high-tech wizardry. In fact, there's almost no personal touch to his work at all. When it's discovered that Gwen's gift has gone missing, he doesn't even refer to her by her name, but rather by her assigned number in their filing system. And he refers to her as like one thousandth of a percent. But what the film does that I absolutely love is that rather than fully villainizing either Steve's new approach or Grand Santa's old approach, the movie comes to the conclusion that both old and new technologies can work together to make Christmas special. All of these themes together make the ending of this movie one of the most satisfying conclusions that I've ever seen in a film. Let's see, there are a few other loose threads that I'd like to tie up before I end this review. There is Peter the Elf, Steve's executive assistant, who Tim and I were wondering, especially on this particular watch through, if he may have been coded as gay. This does bring up some unfortunate and outdated stereotypes when it comes to his character, and I do wish the crew would have spent a little bit more time on his character just to make him a little bit more fully fleshed out. But I also know that maybe they probably wanted to do it and there was some studio head involvement, in which case I'm not gonna put too much blame on the animators here, especially because they were trying to make a children's film in a medium that has historically not been great, at least in theatrical animation, um, about being inclusive of LGBT characters. So there's that. There is also the matter of the accidental alien subplot in which Grand Santa and Arthur's wild antics with the sleigh make various world leaders think that there is an alien invasion happening on Christmas Day. This side plot isn't bad per se, and it does play into a little bit how the movie ends and does build Grand Santa's character a little bit more, which I appreciate. But at the same time, it's probably my least favorite aspect of the film. It's definitely not as compelling as the main quest. I talked a little bit earlier about the attention to detail here, and I just want to mention a couple more things. There are so many wonderful indicators of place as Grand Santa and Arthur and Bryony travel the globe in their quest to um, get Gwen's present to her, and there's wonderful things like you see the CN Tower in Toronto. The crew has also highlighted the different ways that different cultures and countries celebrate Christmas, um, and this is especially prominent in the scene where they accidentally tried to deliver a gift to Mexico. They encounter gifts left in shoes, and the score also takes on a bit of a Latin feel. Speaking of the score, Harry Gregson Williams, who is one of my personal favorite composers, does some excellent work here with the score. At once combining spy-themed music and some especially anthemic parts, with some classic Christmassy feel, complete with jingle bells. And the last detail that I didn't notice until my most recent viewing of the film is that they got the timing of the sun coming up in Great Britain almost absolutely right. Uh, for context here, the sun usually doesn't rise around here until like 7.30, 8 o'clock a.m. And that's about when it rises in the movie. So, you know, just good on you for getting those details in there. I love that. And of course, I have to shout out this excellent cast who committed fully to their roles. James McAvoy as Arthur, Hugh Laurie as Steve, Jim Broadbent as Malcolm, Bill Nighy as Grand Santa, who is amazing by the way, and Imelda Staunton of course as Mrs. Claus, and Ashley Jensen as Bryony. They give their all to these roles in this movie, and it's so refreshing to see an animated voice cast that aren't like, you know, trained voice actors but our big celebrities get super excited about this project that they're a part of. In the end, this movie just has a wonderful message about the importance of family and putting others' needs above your own. So, I haven't mentioned the box office yet and that is because it made $140 million on a $100 million budget which means it just barely broke even. So. Why in the world did this movie have a lukewarm financial response when it first came out? I mean, really, I would kind of put this down to marketing more than anything else. Being a very British movie in its essence, I think the American team in charge of marketing this movie were concerned that Americans would be too stupid to get some of the British humor, and so they created these little interstitials that had nothing to do with the actual plot of the movie 
in order to appeal to American kids, and watching them now, it is quite cringy and a bit patronizing. I mean, I guess that really is what they did. They tried to dumb down the complexity of the movie to get young kids to be able to go see it. I guess when you consider the majority of Sony animation's output up to this point, it would kind of make sense for them to go that route. Not to mention the Justin Bieber Christmas music video that played before the movie in cinemas and is included on the DVD and plays over the credits. I actually, fun fact, did not have any desire to see this movie when it first came out. Not because I thought it was bad, I guess. I mean, the interstitials looked fine. I just, I didn't really know much about it. So when my aunt and my mom suggested that we all go see this over Thanksgiving weekend that year in 2011, I remember just, you know, being like, eh, about it to begin with. But then as soon as the movie started and all the way through, I was just like, this is amazing. And it is amazing. And I loved it then and I love it now. As I say, the box office take probably was a huge signal that the American marketing team had backfired a little bit. Another factor to consider here is that Arthur Christmas was actually made at almost the same time as another Ardman production called The Pirates. There's different subtitles depending on whether you're in the United States or in the rest of the world. Again, dumbing it down. In fact, Arthur Christmas and The Pirates were actually released within five months of each other. Unlike Arthur Christmas, which although it had 18 months of pre-production in the UK and is a very, very British movie, was CGI animated in the United States by Sony, The Pirates was a fully stop-motion animated movie that had the classic Aardman style and was produced on location in the Aardman Studios in Bristol in the United Kingdom. The Pirates also had the benefit of being directed by a longtime creative mind at Aardman, Peter Lord. Given what I've seen, Ardman reasonably, I think, seemed more concerned with their classic homegrown production than it was with their CGI Christmas classic. But if this made the team behind Arthur Christmas the quote-unquote B team at Ardman, then perhaps they also didn't have as many problems with micromanagement from studio heads and could really tell the story that they wanted to tell. To me, Arthur Christmas of these two is the superior film, and it does make me sad that it was left off the Best Animated Feature category in 2011, while The Pirates made it onto the nominations list in 2012. Perhaps the Academy didn't think that Christmas movies counted, or Sony and Artemon didn't run a big enough for your consideration campaign. That is also probably the case. As for what this film's director Sarah Smith has been up to in the intervening years, she has actually left Aardman and gone on to form her own animation studio in 2014 called Locksmith Animation, along with Julie Lockhart and Elizabeth Murdoch. Locksmith Animation's feature debut is titled Wrong's Gone Wrong and is scheduled for release in April 2021. And I'm actually really excited to see it because it's not every day that a new animation studio comes on the scene and I'd like to see what's going on in Indie Land. In the end, I think in the years since its release that Arthur Christmas has gone down as a holiday classic and is a staple in any person's holiday collection, thanks in large part to really, really good word of mouth. It is the exact type of heartwarming Christmas movie that brings you so much joy, and really, that's all I can ask for in a really great holiday film. Thank you guys so much for watching this week's Women in Film review. As I mentioned in my homecoming review two weeks ago, I will be doing one more Women in Film review to close out season two on December 17th, after which I will be taking a much needed holiday break. I will be back in January 2021 with season three of Women in Film reviews, along with some possible new content. So if you don't want to miss out on any of that, you should subscribe here on my main channel and on my second channel. You should also definitely become a patron of mine on Patreon. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, my husband and I do movie commentaries each month. Before the Arthur Christmas one comes out at the end of December, however, you'll probably have noticed that November's movie commentary is now up. It is for How to Train Your Dragon. We had such a blast, so much so that by the time we finished the commentary and closed everything out, the movie had actually started again because we had so much to say. So make sure to become a patron and check those out and you'll also get access to some other goodies like some behind the scenes tidbits, polls to vote on the women in film reviews that I do, 
um, along with maybe some other new stuff in January. Who knows? Another perk of being a patron of mine is that I will personally thank you at the end of each Women in Film review for your support, so thank you Tim for being one of my patrons. You can check out all of my previous work available on my website, helen girlheistcom You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and my Facebook page. All the links to everything that I mentioned will be down in the description. And that is it for this week. Thanks again so much for watching. Remember to keep living awesome lives, and I will see you all back here in two weeks for the season two finale of Women in Film Reviews. Bye, guys.